on World News Tonight. The summit ends. Madrid summit concludes with far-reaching decisions to transform NATO amid criticisms of the bloc's aggression. Historic pick. Ketanji Brown Jackson becomes the first black woman to serve in the U.S. Supreme Court. Manipur landslide. Rescue operations continue as many dead and dozens missing as huge landslide hits India. And Hong Kong celebrate. A variety of events were held to mark the 25th anniversary of the Hong Kong's return to motherland. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. The NATO summit in Madrid drew to a close with decisions to transform and strengthen the alliance. While the three-day summit was dominated by NATO's response to Russia's war in Ukraine, host Spain urged allies to consider a bigger role for the alliance in North Africa and the Sahel. The NATO summit marked the biggest shift in European security in decades, with Sweden and Finland hailed as candidates to join the organization after Turkey no longer threatened a veto. Finland and Sweden uh, will become members of uh, the alliance. We are there to protect all allies, and of course also Finland and Sweden, and we are prepared for all eventualities. Sweden and Finland will sign the protocol to join on Tuesday, all 30 NATO member states will need to ratify their request for accession. Thank you for, uh, what you Biden did. on Wednesday thanked Erdogan for all the work he was doing, not just on Sweden and Finland, but also trying to secure grain trying supplies. To get grain out of, uh, out of Ukraine and Russia. I mean, you're doing a great job. I just want to thank you. Before leaving the summit, Biden said he backed sale of F-16s to Turkey and said he plans to announce more military aid for Ukraine in the coming days. We provided Ukraine with nearly $7 billion in security assistance since I took office. The next few days, we intend to announce more than $800 million more, including new advanced Western air defense systems for Ukraine. Britain and France, too, pledged to send more weapons, with allies saying they would support Ukraine for as long as it takes. NATO aims to have more than 300,000 troops on high alert from the middle of next year on the eastern front of Europe. While Russia is presented as the most significant threat, China, in a strategic document for the next decade, was also singled out as posing challenges to NATO's value. Now, 1st of July celebrates the 25th anniversary of the British return of Hong Kong to the Chinese rule. And to celebrate the anniversary, Chinese President Xi Jinping headed to Hong Kong, making his first trip outside the mainland since the pandemic began. President Xi Jinping arrived in Hong Kong Thursday, a day before the official ceremony, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the British handover of the island. After arriving by train, she explained how Hong Kong has overcome numerous challenges over the years. In the past few years, Hong Kong has withstood severe tests again and again, overcoming risks and challenges one by one. After the wind and rain, Hong Kong has risen from the ashes and also demonstrated a high level of vigor and vitality. He also stressed that the one country, two systems will bring a brighter future to Hong Kong. Under Xi's leadership, Beijing has reshaped Hong Kong during the past two years, cracking down on protests and freedom of speech. A more patriotic curriculum has been introduced at schools. Marking the occasion, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson accused Beijing of failing to keep its promises. But on the 25th anniversary of the handover, we simply cannot avoid the fact that for some time now, Beijing has been failing to comply with its obligations. It's a state of affairs that threatens both the rights and freedoms of Hong Kongers and the continued progress and prosperity of their home. In a video message posted on Twitter, he stressed that his country was not going to give up on Hong Kong. The anniversary marks the halfway point of the 50-year governance model agreed upon between London and Beijing. But the UK has become increasingly critical of Chinese rule there, especially following Beijing's implementation of a harsh national security law in 2020. Washington also criticized China's Hong Kong policies. 
The spokesperson of the U.S. National Security Council said in a statement Thursday that the world is witnessing a dismantling of Hong Kong's democratic institutions as well as unprecedented pressures on many areas. Russian forces in Ukraine continue to shell the city of Lysychansk, where reportedly around 15,000 people still remain. And now the world saw the world's largest exchange of prisoners to date. Over in Ukraine, shelling from Russian forces continues in the eastern city of Lysychansk in the Luhansk region. Serhii Haidai, the head of the regional military administration on Wednesday, said that the fighting is continuing on the outskirts of the city and that Russian forces are trying to storm constantly. Around 15,000 people are in the city despite recommendations for them to evacuate. Meanwhile, Ukraine on Wednesday carried out its largest exchange of prisoners of war since the beginning of the invasion, recovering 144 soldiers captured by Russia. Ninety-five of them were stationed at the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. I would like to tell my loved ones that I will be back with them very soon. The emotions are overwhelming, but the journey was very difficult, because it was one of many attempts to return home. The Ukrainian government released an equal number of soldiers of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic and Russia in exchange. Meanwhile, the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights published a report Wednesday about the situation in Ukraine. According to the report, since the beginning of the invasion on February 24 up until May 15, there were over 8,000 civilian casualties in Ukraine. But according to an update by the UN office this week, as of Monday, the number is at 10,631. The UN said it believes that the actual number is considerably higher as the update only includes the figures the mission was able to independently verify. Meanwhile, NATO on Wednesday formally invited the longtime neutral Finland and Sweden to join the alliance. The bloc collectively decided to approve the country's applications to join after Turkey dropped its objections Tuesday. The decision will now go to the 30 member states' parliaments and legislatures for final ratification. In response, President Putin warned that Russia would respond with threats similar in kind if NATO troops and infrastructure are deployed to Finland and Sweden. Now over in neighboring India, at least 14 people have died and another 60 are feared trapped after a massive landslide in a remote area of the northeastern Indian state of Manipur. Drones show that rescue workers battling heavy rains to pull out bodies for survivors from under the debris. The landslide occurred at a railway construction site where workers were sleeping in a makeshift camp overnight in the early hours. More bodies were expected to be pulled out from the debris where the army personnel, villagers and railway employees were feared trapped. This month, unprecedented rains have lashed India's northeastern states and neighbouring Bangladesh, killing more than 150 people. Millions have also been displaced by the catastrophic floods in recent weeks and in some low-lying areas, houses have been submerged. According to the Indian Army, relentless search operations will continue during the night. Army helicopters were on standby and assisting in rescue operations at the site of the landslide. Over in the U.S., Ketanji Brown Jackson was sworn in as a U.S. Supreme Court justice, making history as the first black woman on the nation's top judicial body, while joining it at a time when its conservative majority has been flexing its muscles in major rulings. With her husband holding the Bible and her two daughters looking on, Ketanji Brown Jackson took the judicial oath Thursday, sworn in by the justice she is replacing, Stephen Breyer, who at 83 is retiring. The 51-year-old is the first black woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, and when the Senate confirmed her nomination back in April, she paid tribute to others who helped pave the way. I am here standing on the shoulders of generations of Americans who never had anything close to this kind of opportunity. Justice Jackson has a long and storied legal career with an expertise in criminal justice and sentencing disparities. She most recently served on the D.C. Circuit Court and is the first former public defender to become a justice. 
Brown Jackson is joining the court at a critical time, with the public's faith in the institution at a new low, and in the wake of its controversial ruling to end the constitutional right to abortion. Her swearing in comes on the same day President Biden slammed the court for its, quote, outrageous behavior in relation to that decision. The first and foremost thing we should do is make it clear how outrageous this decision was and how much it impacts not just on woman's right to choose, which is a critical, critical piece, but on privacy generally. But for those hoping Justice Jackson would swing the court to the left, her addition does not change its ideological balance. Conservatives will maintain their six to three majority. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, in collaboration with the Department of Defense, announced an agreement to purchase 105 million doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for a fall vaccination campaign. The U.S. has agreed to pay $3.2 billion for more of Pfizer and partner BioNTech's COVID vaccine. The companies announced the deal for 105 million more doses on Wednesday. Pfizer said it includes supplies of a retooled vaccine for the Omicron variant if it gets regulatory clearance. Advisors to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration this week recommended changing the design of booster shots for this fall, an effort to combat variants of the coronavirus that are circulating. The average price per dose in the New Deal is over $30. That's a more than 50 percent increase over what the U.S. paid in its initial contract with Pfizer. One reason for that, the contract includes vaccines in single-dose vials. While more expensive to manufacture, single-dose vials can help reduce waste of unused shots. The U.S. government also has the option to purchase up to 195 million additional doses. That would bring the total number of potential doses to 300 million, according to Pfizer and BioNTech. Since first getting authorization in 2020, the U.S. government has distributed close to 450 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine within the U.S. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, over 350 million of those doses have been administered. Torrential downpours are disrupting traffic in the nation's capital for the first time in two years in South Korea. Jamsu Bridge, which crosses the Han River in central Seoul, has been closed off. The U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday imposed limits on the federal government's authority to regulate carbon emissions in a ruling that will undermine President Joe Biden's plans to tackle climate change. The court's ruling restricts the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from existing coal and gas-fired power plants under the landmark Clean Air Act anti-pollution law. In line with the series of sweeping decisions made over the past week, the court's six conservatives were in the majority, with the three liberals dissenting. Biden said the decision risks damaging our nation's ability to keep our air clean and combat climate change, and that he directed his legal team to work with the Justice Department and affected agencies to review the Supreme Court ruling. Stephen Cohen is a former EPA consultant and director of the Earth Institute's research program on sustainability policy and management at Columbia University. Climate change is uh, an existential crisis, and uh, this very ide ideological court uh, is more concerned with limiting government than in dealing with this existential crisis. The ruling was based on what is called the major questions legal doctrine that requires explicit congressional authorization for action on issues of broad importance and societal impact. The ruling is likely to have implications beyond the EPA as it raises new legal questions about any big decisions made by federal agencies. The Supreme Court ruled that the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, does not have broad authority to limit greenhouse gas emissions by shifting energy production away from coal-burning plants and towards clean sources. This year's monsoon is pounding the central part of South Korea. There's been numerous cases of flooding and landslides. As of 6 p.m. on Thursday, the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters said two people have died from the heavy rain. 
Over 80 properties have been flooded. The last time Tamsu Bridge in Seoul was closed off was in the summer of 2020. Back then, water levels peaked at over 11 meters. Though water levels aren't as high as before, authorities are still on the lookout because the country is expecting to see even more rainfall until Friday morning. Up to 150 millimeters is set to pour down in the greater capital region. The capital region has already seen what 130 millimeters worth of rain overnight can do. On Thursday morning, there were reports of major traffic congestion. By 9 a.m., cars in Seoul were driving at an average speed of just 14.7 kilometers per hour. Large streams had overflown with water, closing off major roads like the Tongbu Expressway. That's why authorities encouraged people to use public transport. Seoul City has extended the number of buses and subway trains operating during rush hour for an extra 30 minutes. The Korea Meteorological Administration has said making an exact prediction as to when skies will clear up is difficult, as rain clouds are rapidly changing. What they've analyzed so far is that the central part of Korea will see heavy rain till Friday morning. Now on the sidelines of the NATO summit, South Korean President Yoon has been promoting South Korea's exports as part of his so-called sales diplomacy. One of his major focuses was nuclear energy, on which President Yoon had talks with his Polish counterpart. The first fruits of President Yoon seok yeols sales diplomacy could be from Poland. Through bilateral meetings with world leaders in Spain on the NATO sidelines this week, President Yoon has been promoting the country's exports. Yoon has pledged to make South Korea a nuclear reactor superpower, and he used the NATO summit to discuss deals with his counterparts to export nuclear power plants. First, we will go all out to win deals to build nuclear power plants in the countries that are about to choose contractors, including Poland and the Czech Republic. During President Yoon's meeting with Polish President Andrzej Duda on Wednesday, Yoon emphasized Seoul's advanced and safe nuclear technology proven through the Baraka project in the United Arab Emirates. As part of this effort, South Korea's industry minister Yi Chang yang also met on Thursday with his Polish counterpart. They signed a deal to form a joint committee and strengthen their cooperation on energy including nuclear power, hydrogen and e-mobility. Also at that meeting were officials from the two nations' major energy firms. Nine contracts were signed on nuclear energy between companies from the two countries, including South Korea's KEPCO and Poland's ILF. Earlier this week, during E's meeting with his Czech counterpart, 10 contracts were signed on nuclear energy and hydrogen between companies from the two countries, including the auto giant Hyundai Motor. One expert on nuclear energy says the projects in Poland and the Czech Republic could bring in billions of dollars to the South Korean economy. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. With the prices for cookout items such as hamburgers and hot dogs have been climbing to 17% compared to a year ago, many Americans are forced to make tough decisions about how they celebrate the upcoming July 4th holiday. Peruvian fighters were fighting to contain a forest fire near the Incan ruins of Machu Picchu as a blaze threatened to close in one of the ancient city highs in the Andean Mountains. Britain's Queen Elizabeth made her third public appearance in a week as she attended a military parade at a Hollywood House Palace during the annual Royal Week in Scotland. US basketball player Brittany Griner is due to go on trial in Russia on drug charges that could see her to face up to 10 years in jail in a case that highlights that already fraught relationships between Moscow and Washington. Samsung Electronics has become the world's first company to start mass production in 3 nanometer class chips. The company said compared to the convention of 5 nanometer, 3 nanometer technology can reduce power consumption by up to 45 percent. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight with a series of events that takes place as Hong Kong marks 25 years since handover. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>